Good morning, everybody. It's the Millennial Prepster here. And as you can see from the title, we're going to be talking about preparedness for beginners, novices, people that are just wanting to get that want to get into it or wanting information about it. And let me be the first to tell you, I had no intention of making this video. I'm only making this video because my brother asked me to make this make this video so he could share it with some of his friends that um, a few of them watch me that are like me. Okay, so what am I? I'm somebody that takes information with a grain of salt. I'm somebody that is very skeptical. I'm somebody that's very free thinking and I'm somebody that has no filter and I say, say it how it is because I fucking can. So with that being said, a lot of people that are like me, we watch you know, preparedness YouTube and watch these influencers on YouTube that talk about preparedness and what they're saying is just complete, completely ridiculous, fear mongering bullshit. I get it. I'm just like you. Totally agree. Um, couldn't couldn't agree with you more. And so, you know, having grown up in the preparedness, um, you know, in preparedness in general, you know, I had a father that's whole profession, his entire life, and to this day revolves around preparedness. I grew up in that. My mom, very, 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 very much, very religious into the whole end of times you know, stuff. So I grew up, I grew up in preparedness. My entire adult life has been preparedness. Look at my channel. It's about preparedness, but it's different. I don't captivate it in this fear mongering. The world's about to end doom and gloom because I just don't believe that. I just don't believe that. And so if you're like me and you look at everything very nuanced and you're very, you're a very critical thinker, well, then this, this video will probably jive very well with your personality and very drive, you know, jive very well with, you know, the thought processes that we may share. And so this video, yes, it's on YouTube, but it's really for my bro. You know who you are. Share it with your friends. Tell me what they think. Like I said, I, I, I told them initially that uh, I don't think people are going to like what I have to say because it goes so against the grain. It goes so against the narrative. And so the first thing I want to behoove you to do is if you're watching this and Please do one thing. Do not spend another dime. Do not spend any money. I'm going to give you 11 things that are going to help you get prepared leaps and bounds over any other advice you're probably going to get out there. You will probably be more prepared after these 11, these 11 actionable items. You'll probably be more prepared than most of the YouTubers out there that, you know, are out there spewing their hoarding nonsense, okay? Honestly, this is going to get you prepared more. This is advice I wish I was given when I first went on my own, but now I can. So, um, and if you're not new to prep, if you're not new to prepping and you've been prepping for a long time, but you can't answer these 11 questions and you know, you can't tell me exactly, um, answer these questions for yourself. You should probably get on that. Um, this literally will change how you look at preparedness and how you prepare. And like I said, we're going to keep all that, you know, doom and gloom bullshit out. There's no fear here. It's just facts, science, actual items, and we're going to go, we're going to go down it. So hope you like this video. I'm going to grab a little more coffee. Um, I've only had a couple cups this morning and, you know, I still need some more, but I hope you guys like the video. Like I said, please, the only thing I ask you to do is do not spend another dime until you've at least looked at the 11 actual items and you've you've done them after that if you want to spend money and you want to go about you know your preparedness lifestyle do so any way you can i don't want to tell people especially grown men and women what to do but please just don't spend like i said don't spend another dime until you've looked at these 11 things and you've applied them that's all i ask because there's there's no reason to so i hope you guys like the video everybody i'm glad you, you made it made it here so far and the reason why i'm saying this is because i've had to go back and re-edit it this is going to be a long video okay i've started going down the the list here and i can tell you this is going to be a long video i don't think it's going to be a joe rogan podcast long but it's it's pretty long so what i'm doing is i'm cutting everything down i'm going to compress it as much as i can there's a lot of information here that I want to give you guys, and that's good. And I'm glad that I'm able to to just come out with this in, information for you and, and rattle it off. But I understand that nobody probably wants to sit here listening to me talk for four hours about um, preparedness. So I want to compress this as much as possible, but I can only compress it so much. So I'm just giving you that fair warning now. But 
everything I'm giving you, I find is, I feel it's gonna be super important. And like I said, I know this video is not for YouTube as a whole. It's on YouTube, but it's really for um, the people that my brother is gonna share this with. And I know they're going to listen to it. So this is really for you guys. And so I wanna give you as much information as possible because I think that's important, but I don't want to just um, be a broken record and drain on and on. So number one, let's talk about determining what you're preparing for and why. Okay. And so this is going to be super important with your overall, with your overall plan. Everything else is going to rely on this one factor really. And I can't get into your headspace here. And I'm going to be very generic on this one, um, on this one point, just because I don't know what's in your headspace. I don't know what it is that you're concerned about. I don't know what it is you're preparing for, but that's irrelevant because I really want to know why I re you really want to ask yourself why. And this is what I mean. For example, I, I talk to people on a day to day basis for hours at a time, um, most days about civil unrest, because that seems to be the big thing that everybody wants to talk about. And uh, I'm not going to bore you with the nuance of that because I'm just going to piss people on YouTube off. But civil unrest is a very interesting thing. So I talk to people about civil unrest. People are worried about civil unrest and they're preparing for civil unrest. And so my next question is why? You know, and you get these people that live in the, in the city and some of them live in the country too. But especially with the people in the city, I find they are worried about civil unrest and they will rattle off stats, numbers, good shit, good shit. You know, these are all the reasons why I'm worried about civil unrest. Crime has gone up this much percentage in my neighborhood. I've looked at all this stuff and I'm like, that's great. That's outstanding. So how are you preparing for that? Why are you preparing for that? Well, all these, all these things, activists, political environment, the funding of the police, you know, economic downturn, higher crime rates, like everything. Okay, so what are you doing to prepare for that? Well, I'm stocking up on guns, bullets, food, water. You see what I mean? And really, you should be asking yourself, do my actions mirror my beliefs? Because if you truly believe that in the city, you're going to have this martial law type scenario where you're going to be forced to play Rambo every single fucking day, maybe you should take a more efficient approach and not spend thousands of dollars on guns, rice, beans, that kind of thing, and just move to a place where that civil unrest is not going to happen or less likely to happen. Because at the end of the day, you can't put a price on your life. And if you think you're going to be playing Johnny Rambo every single day, and you're going to be totally fine, you, you, you're... You're being ridiculous because at that point, you're just liquidating your assets. Eventually, you're going to have to move up, move out because if you're playing Johnny Rambo every single day, you're not growing food. You're not procuring water. You're not doing all these things because you're too busy fighting a war. So eventually, those supplies are going to run out. And when they run out, you're going to have to do the most efficient thing that you were supposed to do, which was leave in the first place, right? That's just one example. Another example, economic collapse, right? Real quick. If you're worried about the economy crashing, money not being worth anything, fiat currency, what are you doing? You need to be a producer of something. Because like I said, you can buy all the preps, you can have all the things, but at the end of the day, if you're not producing something, you're liquidating assets. And you're doing exactly the same thing the last guy. They're all intertwined. So if you're really worried about an economic collapse, is buying a bunch of rice, beans, guns, bullets, really going to help you with that economic collapse? Or should you be really putting your time and energy into being a producer of things? And I know this isn't this is unpopular because this goes against the preparedness narrative. The preparedness narrative is I'm going to sell you a bunch of fear porn. I'm gonna, going to sell you a bunch of scary shit so you buy my shit. Go to my Patreon account. Go to my Amazon store. Buy this. Buy that. That's how you be prepared. That's how you face any catastrophe. Well, no, maybe the most efficient thing that somebody should do is leave that area. Maybe the most efficient thing somebody should do is be a producer of something so they have additional stores of, of revenue com coming in. Maybe the most efficient thing to do would be to do X, Y, and Z. You see what I mean? So really what I'm asking you with number one, determining what you're prepared for and why, are your beliefs going to be mirrored by your actions? Is what your actionable self going to do mirror what you believe? Say it vice versa if you have to. At the end of the day, is what you're preparing for and how you plan to prepare for it going to mirror each other? Your actions should mirror your beliefs. 
If they're not, you should probably figure that out before you start spending a bunch of money and going down the rabbit hole. Number one, determine what you're preparing for and why. Number two, go through your pantry and determine how many calories you have in your home right now. Determine how many calories you have on hand right now. And the reason why this is important is because as, as Americans, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at this, we are very wasteful. 40 to 60% of all food is wasted. Okay. And so the reason why that's important to look at, important to understand is because you'd be surprised how many calories you actually have in your home right now. And the big issues that people run into is most people don't have a meal plan. And we'll talk about that in a bit, but we just kind of make things as we go. So we make frequent trips to the store to buy a little bit of produce here and there, depending on what we're wanting to make, you know, Oh, I want to make this dish. So I need to go grab, you know, this from the grocery store right quick. Oh, we're going to make tacos tomorrow. So we need to grab this and this and that. And so you have calories on hand and if you needed to, and you were forced to, you could do it, right? You would have a lot of calories that you could, the average, the average home, depending on, you know, where you live and who you are, obviously you have more calories in your house than you're aware of, but you don't know what you don't know. So instead of going out right now and buying hundreds of pounds of rice and beans and just, you know, Hey, there you go. I have some shit stored up. I'm good. Instead of having that false equivalency and having that false trust in, you know, a bunch of starch, really go through your, go through your cabinets right now, go through your pantry and really look at how many calories you have on hand and what those calories are from. Are you may, are most your calories from starches, you know, pastas, rice, beans, or most of your calories from vegetables, produce, fruits. Some people are, or you like me and most of your calories come from animal products, you know, really determine what calories you have on hand and where they're coming from. Number two. number three, this is going to be super important when it comes to your food preps. Okay. Record and have a record of the last few weeks, at least the last week of meals, preferably having a month, you know, the more data, the better, but really determine what it is you actually eat. And then ask yourself the same question that you have been asking yourself. Why is that? You know, and if you can't remember um, what, what, what you've eaten the last few days, week, month, start recording your meal starting now. Trust me, you have time. Um, there's no reason to buy large quantities of food that you're not going to eat. So like I said, really determine what it is that you're eating and why. And this is important because you don't know what you don't know, right? So if you're going through your, like, for example, if you go through my pantry, you're going to see that we do have some, we, we do have some pasta stuff. We do have some rice stuff. Um, but we have a lot of animal products, a lot of animal products, lots of freezers full of meat. Why is that? I'm a food producer and I'm a fat kid. I love food. I love meat, chicken, turkey, duck, cow, <laughs> you know, rabbit. We, we have it all, quail, chicken, you name it. I like to eat food, right? I love food. And so if you look at my pantry, you're gonna see, you're gonna see a lot of that. Um, a lot of the produce that we have, here's, shoot, I got some produce right here. It's all from the garden, but, you know, zucchinis, lemon cucumber, walla walla onions, you know, all stuff from the garden, right? So it's important that you really determine what kind of food stuff you have, right? So for us, I mean, that's that's what that's what's going to be a lot of a lot of produce and a, a ton of animal products, right? Now we can talk about the health aspects of that of that later, but fresh fruits and vegetables and meat is bulk of what we eat here on the homestead, and. That's the reason why, because it's the easiest to create and produce here. So go through your pantry, really determine what, what is in your pantry and why you eat that. So if you have a lot of hamburger help, and I'm not judging, a lot of hamburger helper, um, chips, uh, microwavable foods, well, that's what I have a lot in my pantry. Well, then if that's the case, ask yourself why. Is it because it's easy? You have kids. These are all things that are going to be important because you don't know what you don't know and what you don't understand. So if you're going through your pantry and you're noticing that the bulk of your calories, as we talked about earlier, and the bulk of your food is in fast, easy to prepare microwavable foods, 
Ask yourself why. And I'm not asking yourself to change. I'm not asking you to change and not buy those things, but just understand why it is that you have that. And that's how you should go about your preparedness. Because if you have a shit ton of microwavables, food that's easy to prepare on hand, very quick, is it really conducive to buy hundreds of pounds of rice and beans, foods that you're not going to eat, you're not going to want to eat? Or is it more conducive to just purchase you know, once you have your meal plan set up, purchase those items, not ne- not even necessarily in bulk, but, you know, so we buy, we did a month's worth of, of inventory and we find that at 30 days, 15 of the days, we buy hamburger helper, you know, a hamburger helper type item for, for that meal. Okay. Well, if you know you buy and you use 15 of them in a month, right? Next time you go to the store and you're buying them. Buy a couple extra. You don't have to buy a shit ton of them. Buy a couple extra. Slowly build that pantry with foods that you're already eating. Okay? Same thing. If you guys like eat tons of fucking dinosaur chicken nuggets and that's just what's easiest for you guys to eat, consume. Like I said, is it more conducive to buy a shit ton of rice and beans or just slowly stock up on stuff that's already in your pantry? Even for a guy like me, when most of my food is coming from vegetables, produce, and tons of animal products, right? Is it conducive for me to buy, just go out there and buy shit tons of rice and beans or just build up on the things that I already have, fruits, vegetables, animal products. So that's what you really should be looking at. Like I said, I don't care what it is that you're doing, but you should understand the why. Why am I doing this? Why is my pantry filled this way? And for a lot of people, you may look at your pantry and be like, you know what? Gosh, you're right. Millennial, we do have a lot of junk food or instant food, and maybe we should slowly start changing our diet. Great. Slowly start changing your diet. Do whatever you want. But just forcing and buying a bunch of foods that are non-palatable to you that you aren't going to eat isn't going to help you because you're going to, like I said, you're going to have this rice and beans that's just sitting there in storage. You're not consuming it. You're not going through it. You see what I mean? So find out what is on hand. Understand what it is that you eat during the month and incorporate the foods that you're already eating into your pantry, grow that working pantry, hashtag working pantry. That's how you should be going about it. Grow that working pantry up and start with that with your preparedness. So instead of going out of your way to buy all this stuff that's gonna cost you a lot of money that you don't need, slowly build up what you already have. And you're gonna know what you have because you've already counted the calories in your home and you've already looked at the meal plan that you had for the last month. You've already started looking at that. You're now recording that. You know what you're eating. So if you're eating 15 hamburger helpers um, a month and that's what you're incorporating into your, into your meal plan currently in, in today's reality, when you go to the store, buy a couple more hamburger helpers, maybe ones that are on sale. Grow that working pantry. So everybody's working pantry is going to be different, but you need to understand what you have in your pantry and why. Number four, determine how many storage containers you have and... Look to fill them up with with those items. Let me give you a great example, just to give you an example. Do you have water storage containers already at your house somewhere? Do you have fuel cans already at your house somewhere? Do you have storage that is currently not being used in your home? Determine what that storage need is, and if you can, fill it up. And if it's going to cost you money, like I said before, don't worry about filling it up just yet. But at least know what you have, right? So if you have some water jugs or you have, you know, some, um, some water containers that aren't filled with water, go to your tap, fill them up. Instead of going out and buying these huge water storage containers that are going to cost you lots of money, look at what you already have as far as storage goes that are, you know, items that are built for that. And if you can fill it up for free, fill it up for free. And if you can't, wait and determine when a good time to fill that up is. So you'd be surprised how many people have, you know, water containers at their house that they've gotten over the years and they're not using. So water is a great example. If you have water storage containers that are specifically for water storage, maybe you should think about filling them up so you have them. If you have are able to identify other storage containers, whether that be for fuel, propane, kerosene, heating oil, whatever, well, at least have those annotated. Maybe, you know, make sure that they're, they're documented that you have this many amount of storage containers that are supposed to store 
this item or fuel and at least have that in here, at least know that you have it. So number four is actual item. Identify what you have that's for storage. Identify what that storage item is. And if you can fill it, especially for free, do so. Number five, take measurements and determine how much space you have available for storage or for projects or for things on the inside of your home. Okay. So nooks, crannies, take a measuring tape and actually measure. Okay. My closet is this big. This is the amount of space that I have. And this is the amount of available space that I have. Look underneath your mattress, underneath your, if you have a stairway, stairway and you have a little, you know, crawl space there, look at every available place that you could think of to put storage and at least understand the storage that you have on hand and the storage that's available. Understand that. Last thing you want to do, and I see this, I see this happen all the time. People go out, they buy a ton of stuff without thinking because it's an emotional reaction. They have this visceral emotional reaction to go out and buy things. They buy things and it stacks up in their home. And then what happens? Because they didn't take the time to properly identify any of the first four or five things we mentioned. They don't know what they're prepping for. They don't know why they're prepping for it. They haven't determined how many calories in their, in their home. They haven't determined what they eat. If they eat, they haven't determined <clears throat> what storage containers they have. They just go out and have this visceral motion to buy shit. So they buy shit. And next thing you know it, they have no place to put that shit. It's not shit that they're going to eat. It's not shit that they're going to use anytime soon. And it's starting to build up in a random room or somewhere in the living room or somewhere where it's seen and it's unsightly. And then what happens? You start to have this, this dissension along among the family, the husband or the wife or the kids or anybody that's occupying that domicile now has to see this. And it, then they have the visceral reaction to this unsightly sight of all this food that they never gonna eat, that they don't wanna eat, and it's there in case this magical pretend emergency is gonna happen. So you can see how all these factors compound. Really easy way to not deal with that. Follow the instructions that I'm already giving you, okay? Understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Understand what you're gonna eat and what you're not gonna eat. Understand why you're gonna eat those and not eat those. And really understand the space in your home. Know where you're gonna put your purchases. Don't have this visceral reaction where you're just going out there and you're buying things out of emotion. Your actions should be your beliefs and you should make these actions based upon your beliefs and you should want it to be done in the most efficient way possible. The only way to do this the most efficient way possible is to have the knowledge, okay, and know what you have available. Know what you can do with what you have. It's very easy. Go about this very scientifically, okay? So take measurements, determine how much space you have, what's available, and go through the flow. That's number five. Number six, take measurements of your yard and determine how much square footage you have available outside. And this can be for a garden, this can be for animals, this can be for storage, this can be for a whole list of different things. So like I said, with the inside of the home, determining where you have space, like taking a ruler and actually measuring and seeing how much space you have available, do the same for outside the home. See how much yard you have, okay? This is going to allow you to have hard numbers and it's gonna allow you to make the best, most efficient decisions for what it is that you're trying to do, okay? And you can maximize space and you can really determine what you can and can't do. So like I said, I highly encourage you guys to take measurements, know how much space you have on the inside of your home and how much space you have on the outside of your home because that's going to allow you to make good decisions based upon data that you already have. So I don't think I have to hit, um, I don't think I have to hit that any more than I already have. So take measurements. Number seven, separate your discardable items. So what do I mean by that? Anything you're gonna throw out. I, if I were you, would separate them into different containers. And I'm not telling you to recycle. I'm not telling you to go green. I'm not telling you to do any of that stuff. What I'm asking you to do is be smart. And if you're going to throw something out, know what you're throwing out. This list, as you're, going, as you're seeing, is a way for you to become more knowledgeable about what you have and what you don't have. And know information, pertinent information, data. The more data you have, the better. So if it was me, an example, separate plastics, metals, compost, com, 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 compostables, and burnables. 
This is why. This is why it works for me. We talked about water storage earlier, right? Well, you'd be surprised, depending on if you live in the everyday average American home, how many plastic bottles you may have. Those big Pepsi. Actually, let me see if I... Oh, look at that. We had a get-together at our house. I don't drink soda, but we had a little get-together at our place and uh, here on the homestead. And we had a good um, barbecue. A bunch of these got brought over, right? Like I said, it's Pepsi. Not a fan, but is what it is. This is an excellent two-liter water storage container. Rinse it out, and guess what? You have water storage. So, like I said, separate your discardable items, plastic, metal, compostables, um, and burnables. So, with your plastics, water storage. In this case, free water storage because I didn't pay for it. Same thing with your metal. Go through your metal. See if there's anything, whether they're metal cans or you know, metal objects you throw out. At least you know what's there. Your compo their compostables. You know, it's going to be your food that you throw away, especially plant, vegetation matter. That's good. I'm not saying to compost, you know, to have a compost pile. I'm not saying to do that, but at least know how much, right? Um, for me, I do have a compost pile, but most importantly, I have pigs. And pigs love food that you don't want to eat. Okay? And then burnables. That's going to be anything that you can burn, cardboard, paper, wood, that kind of thing. So not only... Is this good for knowing what you can reuse, but it's also important to determine how much waste you're producing, right? So for me, I look at, you know, my discardables and I can be like, okay, plastic, can reuse that. Metal, recycle it, um, either get money, if you live in a state where you can get money from it, that's a way to get a uh, revenue stream. But, you know, you can recycle it and you can you can repurpose metal for a bunch of different things, right? If you're looking at your, you know, things that you would compost. That's free food for somebody, whether it be your chickens, pigs, etc. Or you can compost it down into plant fertilizer for your plants, right? We're making, we're maximizing everything we have. Your burnables, I don't know where you live, where I live. I can, you know, if it's not fire season, you know, I can burn burnables, which would make great biochar, which in return is great for you know, my garden. So these are all ways that you can determine how much trash you produce in, in, a, in an effort to minimize it. And also is going to give you opportunities to reuse it for free preps. So those are all things that I highly consider looking at. And if nothing else, maybe you determine, you know what, do I really need to buy? I mean, I buy all these cans of beans or I buy all these cans of this food. Maybe I should just, you know, go and maybe I'm going to be go green. I'm going to use reusable, you know, glass mason jars or whatever, or maybe I'm going to source this food item from a place that doesn't produce so much um, trash waste for me. These are all things to, to think about, right? So I don't know what it is for you, but at the end of the day, I'm not asking you to go green. I'm not asking you to recycle, but having that knowledge can be super helpful. Number eight, I need some coffee for this one. Okay. Real preppers are going to be upset with me on this one because real preppers don't do this. If you live in the city, especially, you need to know and you need to check and know the restrictions that you're going to have to be working with. So check your CCNRs, your HOA, your local and state ordinances, municipal codes, laws, Look for specific restrictions um, regarding for things like gardening, animals, storage, fence height, building restrictions, renewable energy laws, etc. Because addressing these from a local perspective, for example, challenging your local neighborhood to allow backyard chickens, for example, will pay dividends in the long term. So preppers love to buy a lot of shit so they feel prepared. But everything is OPSEC, secret. They can't write a letter to their local HOA because we they, they don't they don't get involved, you know. They don't get involved. They're patriots, don't get me wrong. They're they're patriots. But they don't like to get involved in their local in their local activity. 
because they don't want people to think they're crazy preppers. And what sending a letter and challenging having backyard chickens has anything to do with being a prepper that hoards stuff is beyond me. But like I said, they are pay preppers or patriots to the core, but they're the first ones to bug out as well. So I, I, I don't, I don't know what to tell you, but if you're just getting started into this, what I would do is, yeah, look at your CCNRs, look at your HOAs under, and understand how those functions work. Right? So I lived in the city at one point and we did have CCNRs. However, when you look at the rules for the CCNRs, there was no real governing body, right? So there was in the, in, in the sense that there were people in, in our neighborhood that were considered to be a part of the CCNR guild, you know? They were the people that would handle complaints. So what happened is everything is complaint driven. So let's say I had chickens in my backyard. Neighbor would complain to the CCNR board. The CCNR board would then come together, convene, say, yeah, millennial, you're breaking the rules by having backyard chickens. We are sending you this, this letter saying that you're breaking, you're, you're breaking the, the contract with the CCNR. And then I could do one of two things. I could say, screw off, or I could, you know, go ahead and fix it. There's no more problems. Let's say I said, screw off. I don't care. Well, then the person that started the initial complaint in my CCN, according to our CCNR bylaws, would then have to come after me civilly. The CCNR would just say, it's a charter that says, yes, millennials breaking the rules. But outside of that, there was no money. There was no dues every month. So they had no power to, you know, come after me. That would be the responsibility of the homeowner that is making the complaint. So then the homeowner making the complaint could come after me civilly. But then they would have to pay for that out of pocket. They would have to sue me civilly out of pocket. The CCNR board would just literally say, yeah, here's a letter saying that we sent it to him. And yeah, he technically is violating the bylaws. So really understand your CCNR and the rules that you have to live by. So understand the rules to the game, okay? HOAs are a little different, especially if, you know, you're paying dues. They have more resources to use against you. Same with your local and state ordinances, municipal codes. So... Like we saw in Florida, not being able to grow vegetables in your yard, you know, I would say that would be something worthwhile to at least address, <clears throat> figure out why. And especially in this day and age, it's so easy, especially right now with everything going on with the economy, everything going on with COVID, everything going on with um, the current state of affairs. It's probably easier now than ever to challenge these, you know, these CCNRs, these HOAs, these rules, these ordinances, these laws, and be like, hey, you know what? Maybe it's okay if we include in our charter that each resident can have two or three chickens. That's reasonable because you're still putting rules in place, but you're putting rules in place that would make it easier for you to, it's always, it's, it's chipping away in a good way, right? People see how things are chipped away to take away freedom, but chip away for more freedom. I'm not saying I'm going to have a flock of 20 chickens, but I think having three is reasonable. No roosters, right? And you can slowly keep chipping away at it. Well, we already have three. What's another one? Let's just make it so we can have four. We've, we've been living with three for this for, for this amount of time. So these are really good ways to that are free. Allow yourself to have breathing room for preparing a sustainability. Same thing with solar panels. There are some places where... You can't have solar panels on your roof because they are considered to be unsightly or they go against the, you know, some kind of beautification charter they may have. Well, I think that's ridiculous, right? So, hey, I think this is ridiculous. Why can't we have solar power play the AOC Okazu Cortez? I care about the environment. You know, I'm sure if you played your cards right and you did it right, you could easily go and you can lobby that chart and they're like, oh, wow, this person's like really green and they really want solar panels. Well, yeah, we should change this archaic charter that we put up. The only reason why we put it up is because it's from the 70s when solar panels were this big and huge and unsightly. You know, no one's even going to notice the, the, the Tesla shingle solar panels that he's putting on or these solar panels or you see what I mean? So a lot of these rules are archaic that come from a time when things were not very efficient, when things were not very sustainable, et cetera, you know, insert, insert word here. So I highly encourage you guys to at least at a very minimum, even if you're not going to 
try to change things in your neighborhood or, or communities, at least know what the rules that you're expected to play by are. At least know the rule book. Okay. I'm not saying change the rule book. I think that you would be really cool if you did. And I think that you would get dividends out of it, especially if you're not planning to, to leave. Um, but at least know the rules that you're expected to abide by. And you'd be surprised how easy these rules are to change, given the fact that they've never been challenged before. And the reason why they were put in place was because they are from a time where the applicability of the concern is no longer there. The solar panels is a great example of that. So like I said, number eight, know the rules that you're expected to live by and why. Number nine, check your energy bill and see what your electric trends are, how much electricity you use. This will be helpful in determining how to tackle your energy needs and most importantly, how to prioritize usage. So obviously you wanna know in totality, how much power do I use? Okay, how much power do I use? Support, right, power needs. Then I would look at when do I use that power? And what you're gonna find is you probably use that power during peak energy times, which are usually at night when people come home from work, when people are trying to get laundry done, when people are trying to wash dishes, cook meals, watch TV, you know, when they're home. Because a lot of people in the morning to the afternoon, evening, they're not at home because they're working, they're being productive people. And then peak power times are gonna be in the afternoon. Well, guess when they charge most? They charge the most during the peak hours. So you could, let's say you use, you know, let's say I use 100 kilowatt hours a month and you use 100 kilowatt hours a month. My bill probably a lot smaller than yours because I use energy during the non-peak times during the day. Like right now, I my meals are going to be cooked. My laundry is going to be done. All this stuff's going to be done during during the day. So when electricity is the cheapest is when all my stuff's going to be done. And so this is a great way for you to save money, right? Because you can use that money for other things, perhaps, right? So you can save money on your electric bill. You can know because information and data is important when you're using that electricity and you can know how much that electricity that you're using is, is costing you. So if in the future, right, let's just hypothetical here because we're not going to spend any money, right? We, 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 we've, we've said we're not going to spend money until we at least know what we're talking about. So in the future, if you know that you have this power need because you've consistently had this power need because you're going to check your last few months year as much data as you can look at, you know how much electricity you're using, you know the trends, you know when you're using it. In the future, if you did decide to use and make an energy prep, you can make an energy prep that is conforming to your energy needs. It's specifically tailored to your needs. You see what we're doing here? We're being smart, we're being efficient, right? So that's what I would do. Number nine, check your energy, energy bill, understand your electric trends, understand how much energy you use, when you use it, and how much it's costing you to use it during the times that you are using it. Number 10, check your water bill. Just like we did with the electric bill, let's check our water bill. This is gonna show you how much water that you're using day to day, your trends, etc. According to the EPA, the average American family uses 300 gallons of water a day and 70% of that water is used indoors. So yeah, I highly encourage you guys to take a look at that and understand how much water that you're using because you're not gonna be able to determine what your needs are unless you know how much you use. Now I get in a you know, for example, a grid down situation or, or something like that, you're going to be using less water. And why are you going to be using less water? Because you're not going to have said water. But how much water usage are you really prepared to not be able to use? If you, let's say you're the average, if you're the average American family and you use on average 300 gallons of water to live your normal everyday life, if you only have 55 gallons of water stored up, how long is that going to last you? I can tell you within a week, you're going to be hurting really bad because you're using a, a percentage point of the water that you would normally use, right? Um, and, you know, it's important, like I said, at the end of the day, I'm not going to get into telling you how much water to have on hand. Just know what you're you, It's important at a minimum to know what your water usage is, how much you have on hand, and what you're going to do 
to bridge that gap because of the why. No why. So being able to bridge that gap between water usage, water available, is super important. And that's why it's important to know what kind of water, water containment you have on hand already, know what kind of potential water storage you, you might be throwing away. All that's important to know. So look at your bills, understand what you're using and understand why. Number 11, learn your local frequencies for fire, EMS and police. And a great free way to do this is phone apps. A lot of them are free. The ones I've seen are free. And it's a great way to monitor what's going on in your area, to know what's going on in your area, whether that be crimes, whether that be fires, whether that be local EMS calls for medical service. This is a great way to get a feeling of what's going on in your area. Because if you're con if you're in an area and you're constantly hearing that there are burglaries going on in your area, it'd be nice to know where they're coming from. Because you can do, if you know where they're happening at, you can do the same thing as what any other investigator would be doing that's auditing this information. See if there's trends, right? So if you know that each one of your neighbors have been getting broken into or there has been break-ins and they're slowly starting to, the crimes are slowly starting to come towards your where your area is, that might be what we call a clue, okay? And like I said, with the phone apps, you can do them for free. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go out there and buy expensive, you know, ham radio or, you know, go get a CB radio. I mean, I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't have those items. But from your phone, if we're just being practical, you carry your phone with you everywhere you go, you know? Everybody has a little Bluetooth thing or AirPods, whatever the fuck you call them. I mean, you can do this and you can monitor this stuff without anyone knowing or hearing. You're not sitting out there with some, you know, Bofang radio constantly listening to, you know, scanner traffic. This is a way to indiscreetly, wherever you're at, as long as you have cell reception or Wi-Fi, kind of figure out what's going on and knowing what's going on. And let's say, I mean, and I'm not saying you're going to listen to it all the time, but let's say you hear some sirens going off. You can get on your phone. You can easily click on it. Okay, the scan. Let's see what's, let's see what's going on here having information, especially what's going on in your local area, that's important because unlike what you're getting from the news, because a lot of preppers, a lot of people getting preparedness, they're fear-mongering based upon the news that they're hearing, based upon what CNN, Fox, MSNBC, local news stations are putting out. That's great. I think it's super important to know what's going on across the world. I think it's super important to know what's going on in New York. I think it's super important to know what's going on in Minneapolis. I think it's super important to know about you know, what Trump's favorite ice cream fucking is. Yeah, that all, all that shit is super fucking important. But you know what's more important? The stuff that's going on in your neighborhood. The things that your local law enforcement, EMS, fire, paramedics, what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's super important to look at. Also, with that, go look at your your police, your police uh, at the very, at the end of each, each month or sometimes each shift, um, they have a complete breakdown of all the calls that your police officers and fire department went to. That's not a bad thing to get a hold of. That's not a bad thing to take a look at and know, okay, what crimes are police officers in my area, fire EMS in my area going to, right? Like I said, if we care about the news and if we look at the news and we, you know, scream that we need to be in fear because of all the stuff going on in the news, the news that should most matter to you in particularly, besides what Trump's favorite ice cream is and what Ocasio-Cortez said that some senator said about her or a congressman said about her, is what's going on in your neighborhood. So check that out. Take a look at that. Like I said, it's free to scan and it's good information to have on hand because if you are going to make decisions about number one, what are you preparing for and why, a good a good thing to help you on that on that plan to help you on that road is to actually know what's going on in your local community day to day. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And number twelve, last certainly not least, I'm adding this one in there. Most importantly, guys, most importantly, remain calm. Remain calm. I'll say it one more time. Remain calm. Don't buy into the fear. Don't make unnecessary purchases based upon visceral emotions. Okay. Make logical decisions using common sense, using science, be intentional, be methodical. 
You have time. You have time, guys. People have been saying this since <clears throat> I started on my own in preparedness. People have been saying this. You got to get prepared now, man. Obama's going to take the guns, man. Civil war, man. They were saying that back then. They were saying that back then. I remember when I first joined the military. I joined the military under you know Bush Sr. I remember when Obama first went into office, everybody saying they're going to take the guns, buy guns. Then when he got reelected again, everybody was saying the same thing, buy guns, buy guns. You know, and it's just like, come on, guys, relax. People have been talking about the end of the world forever. Since the start of world, mankind, they've been talking about the destruction of mankind, right? So you have time. Be intentional, be methodical, do things that make sense. Like I said, you can go out there and just buy, you could easily spend thousands of dollars to buy a year supply of food that you're probably not going to eat because you're not, because they're not, they're not things you're going to want to eat, right? So you could easily buy tons of food that you're not going to eat because it's going to make you feel safe, right? Because it's a, it's emotional reaction. You feel safe because you know there's food, even though it's like, I'm not going to eat that food, but if I had to, it's there. So it's this, it's this feeling of false sense of security, right? You can buy all the guns and buy all the bullets. And I'm not saying not to, but you, you can, you can do all that stuff, right? Um, you can spend all this money on a generator and you can spend all the money on gasoline, but are you really making the best decisions? Because is it really, is it is it best practice, right, to buy, for example, a generator without knowing what your energy needs are? Is it most efficient to buy a generator without knowing what your needs are? You can go out there and buy a top of the line generator that kicks out, you know, 200 kilowatts. That's great. That's gonna be a lot of money. That's gonna be a lot of fuel. And it's probably gonna be overkill for what the average person, average person needs. Is there a more efficient generator to go with? Well, how do I know what efficient generator to use if I don't know what my power consumption is, right? Same thing for your water. Can you buy a huge water catchment system, 16,000 gallon drum that you put? Yeah, absolutely. More water, the better, right? That's great. But is there a more efficient way to go about it that's gonna meet your needs just as well? That's going to be able to allow you to have money and spend money on, on other things. Hopefully you see how this is all interacting. A lot of your answers can be solved by breaking down the nuance and looking at it scientifically and methodically. Okay, so really understanding what you're doing and why is the most efficient way to go about preparedness. Stop buying into the fear, stop. There's no reason to buy into the fear. <clears throat> There's no reason. So I don't wanna beat a dead horse. I know this has gone gone on long enough, but I'm really encouraging you guys. Don't buy into the fear. You guys are obviously smart. You know when somebody's trying to sell you some bullshit. You know when somebody's trying to sell you a product. You know when somebody's trying to get you to go on their Patreon, get you to go on their Amazon store and spend money, and they do it using fear. People have been talking about, like I said, the demise of mankind since the start of mankind. If you watch Preparedness YouTube, you can see people have been talking about bugging out and economic collapse for years and years, and they're going to keep talking about it for years and years. And after the collapse happens, right, and things get better again after that, they're still going to be talking about the next time it's going to happen. So I encourage you guys, be methodical, don't fall into the fear, and please, 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 please. Don't spend money until you actually understand what it is you're getting into and why. Hope you guys like the video, and as always, long live the Republic.